Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be doing a little kill count on The Avengers, which released back in 2012. This film was one of the most hyped up blockbusters of all time and earned $1.519 billion at the box office, becoming the 10th highest grossing film of all time when not adjusting for inflation. And if you've seen this film, it's not hard to see why. The joy of this film comes from, you know, just watching the characters interact with each other, and that's what this movie does really, really well. They all bounce off of each other so well, and you know, my favorite scenes in here, they, they aren't even the action scenes, but rather just the little moments between the characters. This movie put its characters first so that the final battle at the end could really land. And boy does it. <laughs> it's still one of the most iconic superhero final battles ever put to film. And, you know, for good reason. It's an epic visual spectacle. But we'll get to that. For now, let's look at the film itself and see how many kills we can find. Just before we get into the film, sorry, me from the future gonna, is, is gonna interrupt the video for a quick second. But I just wanted to say that this video and this channel is in no way affiliated with Dead Meat. This video is inspired by their content, I'm a huge fan of them, and I kind of wanted to just put like my own spin on what they do. And if you guys don't watch the YouTube channel Dead Meat and you're a fan of horror movies, like. What are you doing? They do great work over there. They talk about horror films. They talk about the behind the scenes of how they were made. They, uh, they, of course, they count kills and do all of that fun stuff. They seem like really great people. And if you love, you know, learning about films or if you love horror movies or learning about how films are made, the behind the scenes stuff, then you guys should like 100% check their channel out. They, they make amazing stuff over there, as I keep saying. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to just get that out of the way that I'm not like, I'm not claiming this idea as my own or anything like that. But yeah, with all of that out of the way, we can just get right on into the film itself. So, enjoy. The movie opens in space. A cosmic being known as The Other addresses his master about the Tesseract, which was the powerful magical cube that you remember from Captain America the First Avenger. These cosmic entities hand a scepter with a glowing rock in it to someone who looks very, very familiar. And from here we immediately cut to a shield base where they've been conducting experiments on the Tesseract. Fun fact, this was filmed at the NASA facility in Cleveland, which happens to be the largest space simulation facility in the world. This is something explained here by NASA representative Jerry Carrick. What we're standing in here is the vacuum chamber, and being a chamber of this size, as you can see, 122 feet tall and 100 foot diameter, it's really a magnificent sight. It's just incredible to look at and completely fits the vibe of like a secret underground facility. It turns out that the cube seemingly has a mind of its own, with it turning things off and on on its own will, and also activating things on its own. Yeah, the cube is a doorway to the other end of space, right? Doors open from both sides. Suddenly, the world begins to shake. As the Tesseract once again activates on its own, it blasts open a portal and... Loki emerges. I love the reveal of Loki a lot, especially that close-up on his sinister face. Oh my god. Loki launches an assault on the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and in the chaos, 16 of them are killed. We immediately establish in this moment that Loki is an extremely powerful threat, you know, even more than when we last saw him in Thor. Afterwards, Loki takes a hold of Hawkeye. Oh, uh, oh yeah, this, this is Hawkeye, it's, it's Jeremy Renner, in case you forgot he was in Thor, but, oh well. Anyway, Loki pokes him with his stick and it seemingly has some sort of mind control effect on him. Fury tries to escape with the Tesseract while Loki starts to mind control other S.H.I.E.L.D. agents like this guy and Dr. Eric Selvig, who is also from Thor. I love that from the first scene, we're really showing how interconnected this universe is. You know, combining some of the characters from Thor with the main MacGuffin from Captain America was such a smart idea and really rewards the audience for paying attention and watching all of the films up to this point. It's revealed that the portal made by the Tesseract is collapsing in on itself, and wanting to waste no time in escaping, Hawkeye blasts Nick Fury, but, but, but don't worry, he's still alive, but I didn't know that when I first watched it. You know, when I, when I first watched this movie way back when, I, I really did think he died in this first scene. Loki and his crew grab the Tesseract and steal a truck outside. Maria Hill, Nick Fury's second-in-command, tries to stop them, but they manage to flee the base. Hill gives chase along with a few other S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, 
However, these two guys sadly get blasted and holy shit that dude that thing just absolutely obliterated their car oh my god hill almost manages to catch up to them when suddenly an avalanche causes her car to be stopped in its tracks meanwhile fury and the other shield agents escape in helicopters as the base falls apart they manage to catch up to loki and his fellow goons i'm, I'm gonna call them goons from now on i hope you don't mind but they catch up to him and as nick fury tries to stop them loki blasts them with his spear and crashes their getaway ride <laughs> thing. I'm also going to count the pilot because, well, there's someone flying the, pl the the helicopter, right? And he probably died here based on the crash, I'm not going to lie. So, yeah, he's on the count. But Loki manages to get away and Fury declares that they are at war. What do we do? We hard cut to an abandoned Russian building where we find Black Widow, once again played by Scarlett Johansson, being interrogated by a few Russian mobsters or gangsters or one of the two. Their tortured interrogation of the woman is cut short, however, by a very important phone call. Barton's been compromised. So she beats the shit out of them and leaves. Uh, I know she leaves like I know she like leaves this guy dangling, but uh, he's not dead when she leaves him, so he won't go on the count. We are then transported to India, where we find Bruce Banner, who is not once again played by Edward Norton, but is now played by actor Mark Ruffalo. A young girl bursts in and pleads Banner to help her father, who is supposedly very ill. She leads him to this shack where it turns out to have all been a trick. Instead, she led him right to the Black Widow who's been waiting for him this whole time. She tells Banner that she's not here to kill him, but to recruit him for some mission. By the way, slightly off topic, but there's a little character moment here that I just absolutely love. Well, I don't every time get what I want. The subtlety in that and really driving home that Banner being the Hulk is costing him happiness in his own life, you know, it really goes a long way. It helps him feel more real and we can feel his anger at his own situation. Natasha reveals that the reason why they want Banner to join is because the Tesseract itself emits gamma radiation and given that he's, y you know, the Hulk, <laughs> he knows more about that stuff than anyone else. He reluctantly joins in their mission, but not without scaring Natasha for a bit first, you know, for fun. The next person to be recruited is none other than Steve Rogers, who seems to be taking his situation quite well. There's also a deleted scene that shows more about Rogers adjusting to life in the future, or his future. Uh, but it's a it's a great scene. Uh, I, I don't know why they cut it out. Uh, but yeah, you guys should definitely check it out if, if you guys are interested. You know, I can't give everything away here. Fury shows up and gives Rogers a file on the Tesseract and what they're dealing with. Rogers is, of course, in. And now we've assembled most of the members of the Avengers, except for one. Stark has been busy working on creating the new Stark Tower, a building run by an arc reactor and is sort of like in charge of it's built off of renewable energy or something they don't really explain exactly what it does but what's important is that colston breaks in and makes his way inside he presents stark with a ultra high-tech hologram screen presentation of the avengers initiative and what they're going to be dealing with. Stark is seemingly entranced by the Tesseract. This is another really small detail, but I really love how the members of S.H.I.E.L.D. have changed their approach when giving the characters info about the mission. You know, Fury doesn't show up to Rogers with something fancy or like high tech. He keeps it simple, just, you know, paper and a folder, something he's probably used to. Uh, and for Stark, they do the complete opposite, you know, just something as high tech and fancy as possible. Meanwhile, in a secret lair, Loki has amassed an entire army of goons, uh, and just, just a whole lot of them. Uh, Loki also takes the time to communicate once again with the other. The other warns Loki that if he fails, his master will hunt him down. There's always a bigger fish. How 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 do you get into this kill count? This is the, this is the wrong movie. Get get out of my vi We catch up with our heroes as they all now finally get to meet each other. And when I say all, I mean these three. <laughs> my personal favorite interaction here comes between Banner and Rogers here. Word is you can find the cube. Is that the only word on me? Only word I care about. It's really highlighted in this scene how much, you know, Rogers respects other people as people. You know, Rogers helps to make Banner feel more like a person, more than just the Hulk. Anyway, the platform they've been standing on turns out to be so much more than what they thought it was. It's a helicarrier. 
which I wrote as if it's a real thing, but pretty much it's like a uh, like a like a warship that flies. <laughs> I think that's the best way to describe it. The filmmakers wanted a design for the helicarrier that would be a blend of fantasy and reality. We went to a more traditional aircraft carrier design, partially because, you know, in the comics it's very bottom heavy. It looks like in this enormous glass palace that you just couldn't stay up. And, uh, you know, the streamlined design that the guys came up with was beautiful, but also you could just buy it. Most of this sequence was done digitally. Uh, pretty obviously, as explained here by executive producer Victoria Alonso. It was designed so that the reflection and the refractions that we were getting was big enough to give us some bounds so that we could actually recreate it and feel that you were in a takeoff area of some sort of carrier in the water, but nobody really knows until it takes off that is actually a, a flying ship. I personally think they nailed it. It looks incredible and real here. The visual effects really do hold up well to this day. On the heli carrier, shield agents are aggressively searching for any signs of the Tesseract or Loki. The helicarrier activates its cloaking device and vanishes amongst the clouds. Back with Loki's goons, we learn that Selvig is actively building some sort of mysterious machine and needs iridium for it to work. Hawkeye reveals he has a way to get it, which re requires him to get an eyeball? Not, you know, I'm not too sure what to make of that exactly. But this forces Loki out into the open and S.H.I.E.L.D. manages to tag him. He's located in Germany and they send Captain America after him. Loki arrives at a gala and manages to blend in with the festivities. To help him sneak in, however, Hawkeye ends up killing these two guards. Poor bastards were just doing their job. But also, I kind of love the way that this dude falls. It's just, it's so goofy to me. I don't know why. Loki makes himself known when he grabs uh, th this guy. His name is Heinrich Schaefer. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, but he grabs him and drills his eye out. Oh my god. A scan of the eyeball is sent to Hawkeye, which he uses to open up this highly protected vault containing the iridium they needed. Loki, wanting to revel in the terror these people are experiencing, corners them outside of the gala and forces them all to kneel. One man, an older fellow, stands up to him in defiance. It looks as if Loki is going to kill the old man when Captain America jumps down just in time and reflects the blast right back at him. You know, the last time I was in Germany, and saw a man standing above everybody else. We ended up disagreeing. I, I just want to say this, like, I don't really like his new suit. It's really the helmet that gets, that just gets me. Like, I don't, there's something about it that looks off, <laughs> you know? I think it works when he doesn't have the helmet on, but it, it I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it is about it. Maybe it's just like the colors. They're just a little too bright. They're, there's just something about it that just doesn't work for me. But anyway, Loki and Captain America have their fight and yeah, it, it is a little, it's a little stiff, right? But I, I also think it, it follows nicely from Captain America's solo movie. The fight itself is quickly interrupted and ended by Iron Man who makes a grand entrance. Finally, Stark and Rogers meet. The team loads up Loki onto their Quinjet, but something about it feels off. It was all just a little too easy. Stark, however, doesn't see the problem, which, you know, stems from his overall distrust of Fury himself. Suddenly, thunder and lightning fill the air. This terrifies Loki as he knows what's coming. Thor bursts into the Quinjet, grabs his brother, and flees. Captain America and Iron Man quickly follow behind him. Thor and Loki's reunion isn't so brotherly. <laughs> Thor and Loki immediately get into a big argument. Loki also reveals that he feels he's above the people of Earth. Why should I not think yourself above them? Oh yes. Then you miss the truth of ruling, brother. The throne would suit you ill. Gee, that line won't come back to bite him in the ass later. Thor tries to convince Loki to come back to Asgard and leave all of this behind. Listen well, brother. I I'm listening. I, I just want to say that this is probably the funniest MCU film in my opinion. I can't show all of the jokes here and you know, in fact, I'm cutting out a lot of them on purpose so that you guys can experience them for yourselves if you haven't already seen this film, which why are you watching this video? <laughs> but anyways, I just think the film does a really great job at having our characters, you know, feel quippy, but they're still in character. You know, they, they don't, nothing that our characters say feels like out of place. It's something a lot of the other films in the MCU down the line try to do, 
but it doesn't work nearly as well as it does here. Nothing in here feels forced, it all feels in character, and I, I just love that. Iron Man and Thor crash into the forest where they get into a huge fight. Thor, using lightning-based attacks, actually ends up charging Iron Man's suit, allowing him to do even more damage than he would have otherwise. But not too long into it, Captain America intervenes and puts their fight on hold. Thor, enraged, slams Mjolnir against Captain America's shield, just decimating the fort. You, you asshole. You see how many trees he f***ing knocked down? Jesus Christ. Anyway, they all calm down. Scene's over. Next. Back on the helicarrier, Loki is transported to a cage that seems to have been designed to hold something much bigger than himself. Fury also reveals to him that the cage will be sucked out of the helicarrier and sent straight back down to Earth if he misbehaves. The team tries to figure out what Loki is planning next. Thor reveals that his brother has an army known as the Shatari, which come from a different world than any of them are familiar with. He plans to use them to take over the Earth. Thus, the machine that Selvig has been building this whole time is actually going to be used to open another portal that will lead the Shatari down to Earth. The Iridium the goon stole is used to help stabilize the machine so the portal won't collapse in on itself like it did back at the S.H.I.E.L.D. base. Banner says that Loki is crazy, which, you know, that's fair, and uh, arguing for his brother and playing devil's advocate, Thor makes the claim that he's his brother. He killed 80 people in two days. He's adopted. And you, you know what? I'm gonna I'm add the 80 to the count, or I, I guess 61 since we counted like 19 of his kills already. Um, now I know I said I'm only counting kills that happen on screen, and while that is sorta of true, <laughs> I'ma I'm just make an exception here because I feel like it and I like that line. Stark, of course, not trusting Fury and the rest of S.H.I.E.L.D., attaches a little doohickey <laughs> to his control panel on the bridge. Stark and Banner begin to analyze the scepter, or, well, one of, one of them tries to. No surprises. Captain America barges in and immediately enters quote unquote dad mode and calms the kids down. Fun fact, allegedly RDJ would hide snacks around the set when filming, so the blueberries he's eating in this scene wasn't a part of the script. Allegedly. It was just something he picked up and started snacking on during the scene. Again, allegedly. <laughs> I can't confirm or deny if this is true. Uh, it might just be one of those, you know, internet urban legends, but if it is, that's kind of fun, <laughs> you know? Um, it works well for the character, it seems like something he would do, you know? Stark, once again, starts pushing his Gen X anti-authority mindset onto Cap. You know, he's really trying to get him to understand that he doesn't trust S.H.I.E.L.D. for a reason. It turns out that the little doohickey he attached was actually a way for his AI assistant Jarvis to hack into S.H.I.E.L.D.'s secure files. Cap ends up beginning to question S.H.I.E.L.D. himself. You know, finally the Boy Scout nature is beginning to crack. He breaks into a secret storage room and begins to sneak around. Meanwhile, Selvig manages to finish his machine. They just need one more thing to complete their mission. Loki, in his cage, is being interrogated by Natasha. She wants to know what happened to Barton and reveals that the only reason she was able to join S.H.I.E.L.D. was because of him. It turns out he was sent to kill her when she used to work as an assassin, but instead he saved her life and gave her a second chance at S.H.I.E.L.D. Loki reveals that he knows almost everything about her because of Barton, and he uses this to try and intimidate her. Meanwhile, our heroes find all sorts of secrets. The tension rises. Loki slams his fist against the wall and threatens to kill Barton. And in doing so, he lets slip that he wants to use Banner to help him escape. You're a monster. Oh no. You brought the monster. Natasha reveals that the whole thing was a ruse, leaving Loki just, just so very confused. Oh, oh Loki, if only you'd seen this coming, you Idiot. Fury, realizing that Stark has hacked into S.H.I.E.L.D., comes into the lab to question him. This is when Captain America enters and reveals that S.H.I.E.L.D. is planning on using the cube to make weapons of their own. Something that Stark then confirms from, you know, hacking into their system. Nat and Thor enter and try to convince Banner to leave, revealing to him that Loki is trying to use the Hulk as a way to escape from his prison. Banner refuses to leave and demands to know why S.H.I.E.L.D. is building weapons of mass destruction. Because of him. Me. Fury reveals that Thor was just so ungodly powerful that they needed to step up their own firepower in case something even stronger were to show up at some point. Thor argues that them using the Tesseract is what drove Loki here in the first place. Then a full-blown argument starts and... 
Oh my god, I love this scene. The way the tension just builds and builds in this scene is incredible. The dialogue is sharp and quick, it all unfolds perfectly. It's my favorite sequence in the film and really highlights how unstable they are as a unit. Loki and his army of goons led by Hawkeye fly a stolen Quinjet and prepare to invade. Hawkeye fires an arrow at the helicarrier that sticks onto the ship for some reason. You'll see why, don't worry. Back on board, the argument continues to get more and more heated. Fury continues to try and get Banner to leave and reveals that the cage Loki is in was made to kill the Hulk in case Banner turned. This, however, won't work because of a story that Banner tells that I cannot put in this video, otherwise YouTube will give me a strike. Um, I, I don't know if they actually will give me a strike, but it's, uh, I don't want to chance it, so I'm gonna leave, I gotta leave that part out, but... Yeah, you, you, get the, you get the gist. The argument ends when the group finally detects the Tesseract and realize something horrifying. The arrow Hawkeye fired explodes, separating the group and destroying an engine. Stark and Rogers rush to suit up to try and fix up the engine. Romanoff and Banner are stuck below, and we finally get the moment we've all been waiting for. <laughs> I want to say I love the design for the Hulk in this film. The filmmakers ended up using motion capture technology to capture the Hulk based off of Mark Ruffalo's face. Four, and they've always been a CGI creature that very much was a CGI creature. But now with the motion capture technology that we have, you know, we're, we're building every expression and movement that the Hulk does off of Mark. It's a real creature, you know, it's, it's very human. There's a sense of humor there. There's an ability to communicate. It adds a layer of humanity to the Hulk. He's not just a creature, and you're really given the chance to empathize with him here. Captain America and Iron Man make their way to the engine when Rogers is yeah, he's just as perplexed as I am looking at that. What the f is going on? Like, what What on earth am I looking at here? Anyway, Natasha, still trying to flee from the Hulk, is saved when Thor knocks the beast away. From here on out, the scene cuts between each of the characters, but for simplicity, I'll just discuss what happens in each moment, one at a time. Loki's goons enter the Tesseract, and they toss a grenade inside, which ends up killing this one poor shield soldier. My, I'm, I'm sorry, man. Fury and Hill immediately fight back. They add two more bodies to our count with their sharp shooting skills. Concerned about the ship's integrity with the Hulk on board, Hill sends a Quinjet to engage the Hulk and get his attention. While that is happening, Fury adds another kill to our count when another goon tries and fails to enter the bridge. Nice try, dude. Hawkeye reveals himself and fires a hacking electrical arrow that shuts down the other engines. Barton flees, and Natasha gives chase. Thor and Hulk are, of course, fighting it out when the Quinjet shows up and engages Banner. Enraged, the Hulk jumps onto the Quinjet and begins to tear it apart. The pilot ejects, the Hulk catches him and launches him away, only for his shoot to go off. Thank God. The jet explodes and sends Hulk back to Earth. Natasha, having now caught up with Barton, engages and reluctantly fights her best friend. It's a pretty quick fight with Romanoff easily subduing Barton, and it ends when she gives him a concussion, which frees him of his mind control. Iron Man is now getting to work on fixing the engine when suddenly two of Loki's goons arrive. Cap swiftly takes them out and adds two of them to our count. He even goes back to his old ways of throwing people into the sky and letting them fall to their death. Oh, how I love you, you violent, patriotic psychopath. Iron Man manages to get the engine back up and running. Finally, their base is saved. Thor, going to check in on Loki, realizes that he's somehow gotten out of his cage. He tries to tackle him, but it turns out it was all a trick. Loki begins to toy with Thor and threatens to send him back down to Earth, when suddenly, Coulson enters and kills this guy. I, I love this character, dude. I, he's, he's the best. <laughs> Coulson, now holding a big gun that even he doesn't understand, threatens Loki with it, only for the god of mischief to stab him in the back, fatally injuring him. Loki drops the cage and sends his brother straight down to Earth. Thor manages to escape his prison right before it hits the ground, and he is left stranded in the middle of a forest. Back on the ship, Coulson warns Loki that he will lose. It's just in his nature. I don't think I'm... <laughs> But it's okay though, Loki manages to walk it off and he joins the rest of his goons in a Quinjet as they flee the scene. Not too long after, Fury finds Coulson who's slowly bleeding out. Coulson tells Fury that their plan was never going to work. His final words are cut off as he unfortunately 
passes on. This was never gonna work. They didn't have something. Back on the bridge, Fury shows Rogers Coulson's Captain America trading card collection, stained with blood. The group is filled with regret and anger. Fury comes clean about S.H.I.E.L.D. wanting to build weapons, but his main priority was always the Avengers Initiative, which was a plan to unite a group of remarkable people to fight the battles nobody else could. Stark suddenly gets up and leaves. We catch up with the other members of the team, like Thor, who is still stranded out on his own, and Hulk, who is now turned back into Banner and is discovered by none other than the late, great Harry Dean Stanton, making a cameo appearance as a security guard. Uh, I love Stanton so much, I think he's an incredible actor, and you may have seen him in films like Alien, or Pretty in Pink, or one of my personal favorite films of all time, Paris, Texas. Seriously, if you guys haven't seen this film, it's it's incredible. Stanton just delivers an absolutely jaw-dropping performance here. It's one of the most emotional films I've ever seen. Go check it out, please. <laughs> we also catch back up with Natasha, who is helping Barton break free from Loki's control. Barton reveals that Loki is planning on making his attack on Earth today putting the rest of the movie on a time limit. Rogers catches up with Stark, where they both try to deal with their grief in their own way. Is this the first time you lost a soldier? We are not soldiers. I love that we're really highlighting their difference here in this scene. Stark is way more of an emotional figure, you know, even if he doesn't necessarily show it fully all the time. Rogers is just way more of a wall, you know, he's learned how to block it all off from the war. Rogers helps Stark to focus on the mission at hand, where they begin to piece things together. Loki made things personal for them, not just to split them apart, but to take them out in a big way. He wants them to come after him so they can die in a big blaze of glory. He wants flowers, he wants parades, he wants a monument built to the skies with his name plastered. Son of a bitch. Our heroes begin to suit up, getting ready for the final battle. Also, these three guys steal a jet. At Stark Tower, Selvig sets up his machine. They're ready for the war to begin. Stark tries to shut the machine down, but it's too late. He tries to blast it anyway, but it's protected by a barrier made of pure energy. Stark, noticing Loki is here as well, decides to engage him one-on-one. -on -one. He removes his armor and discreetly puts on some sort of weird-looking bracelet. During all of this, he has a drink and tells Loki that the Avengers are coming. Because if we can't protect the Earth, you can be damn well sure we'll avenge it. Loki, in turn, tries to mind control Stark, but that doesn't work the way he thought it would. Since Loki couldn't get this part of his plan to work, he then decides to just launch him out of window. One of Stark's suits blasts out of the wall and follows behind. It lines up with Stark's bracelet and suits him up. Iron Man flies back up to Loki and blasts him just before the portal opens up. All of this happens while the Shatari begin to come through. Loki's war has finally begun. Stark flies up and fires at the first wave of aliens. And I just want to say here, I'm not counting any bastard Shatari on this count. I don't care what Shatari rights activists have to say about that, they're not allowed. I'm sorry. Also, while I'm here, I just want to mention that a lot of this final battle was actually done practically. Of course, there's a lot of things they couldn't do, um, but there's some, you know, things that they did for real in camera that I'm just blown away by, you know? They blew up about 15 cars in this one sequence right here. We blew up 15 cars. We had 21 explosions, 30 to 40 stun people, 350 extras. I mean, if that doesn't get your blood going, then nothing will. It's insane, and this final battle holds up really, really well. You're gonna hear me say that a lot in, in this segment, but for good reason, it's because it does. It's still just as exciting as it was the first time I saw it in theaters as a kid. Thor and the Quinjet arrive at the scene. Thor fights his brother, but he isn't able to stop him from blasting the Quinjet out of the sky, sending these three down to Earth. They now have to fight the rest of the battle on foot. Thor tries to convince his brother to stop this war, but instead, Loki just stabs him and flees the scene. More and more Shatari begin to arrive, including this weird whale-looking guy. He's my favorite. Cat, Black Widow, and Hawkeye work together to save some of the civilians trapped and under fire from the Shatari. Cap runs up to a couple police officers and convinces them to set up a perimeter and to help get people out of harm's way. Meanwhile, Iron Man manages to catch the attention of the whale guy, but there's not much he can do about him. Luckily, however, Banner arrives and joins up with the rest of the team on the ground. So, Iron Man leads the whale right to them. Captain America tells Banner 
Now would be a really great time for him to get angry. And Banner responds with... I'm always angry. Hulk slams his fist against the Shatari, and Iron Man finishes the job. The incredible Avengers score by Alan Silvestri is kicking right now as we get the most badass shot in the entire MCU. If you love this film, you love this moment. It's so epic and exciting. They're here and they're finally working together as a team. Loki sends the rest of the Shatari down to Earth. Captain America commands the Avengers, assigning them in ways so that each of them can help contain the Shatari threat as much as possible. This is, like I said before, this is one of the most exciting final battles of the entire MCU. I will not be showing all of it here, you know, clearly, so I'm just going to keep it to the main story bits of the fight for the rest of the video. But please, if you haven't seen the film by now, um, <laughs> go go watch it for yourself, <laughs> please. And if you have seen it, revisit it. It's a great time. Hell, me talking about it all this time makes me want to watch it again, and I already rewatched it to write the script for the video. <laughs> Black Widow, who has gotten pretty good at using the Shatari's weapons, devises a plan that might help close the portal. If you can penetrate the electric shield with something powerful like the Shatari's weapon, that might allow them to shut off the machine and close the portal for good. Captain America helps give her a boost up and she catches a ride with the Shatari. Of course, she kills them and steals their flying bike thing. She takes it for herself and drives, or she controls this guy and drives. We also get this incredible wonder that shows each hero doing their thing and fighting off the Shatari. I, I wish I could show it fully here without having to cut so much, but you know, trust me, it, it, it looks insane. Meanwhile, Fury talks with the World Security Council, which is, according to the MCU wiki, a group of some of the Earth's most powerful politicians that function as oversight to S.H.I.E.L.D. The council has made the decision to nuke Manhattan. Fury delays it and tells them to wait until the team 100% cannot handle it. Back on the battlefield, Loki pursues Natasha. Hawkeye helps her out and finally gets his revenge on Loki when he launches an arrow right at him. The Hulk arrives and knocks Loki inside. Loki tries to intimidate the Hulk, but things don't exactly go the way he thought they would. But I will not be bullied by that. If you saw this film when it came out with a packed crowd, you remember this scene just bringing down the house, you know? I saw this movie twice in theaters and both times that was the hardest I've ever heard a crowd laugh at, at anything. It's just such a great moment. Outside of Stark Tower, Dr. Selvig is slowly coming out of his mind control after being hit by the energy blast when Stark tried to blow it up earlier. Natasha arrives to help shut it down. Selvig reveals to her that he implemented a way to cut the power source on the machine and advises her to use Loki's scepter to try and break through the energy barrier. The World Security Council have decided to launch a nuke onto Manhattan, regardless of what Fury says. Fury intercepts the jet and stops it from taking off, but another one manages to get away, and launches a nuke right at the city. Fury contacts Stark and informs him of the situation. They have three minutes to intercept the nuke. Stark's suit, which is running low on power, puts the rest of the energy into the thrusters and he goes after the bomb. Natasha breaches the energy barrier on the machine with the scepter. She can close it, but Stark tells her to hold. He gets a hold of the bomb and flies straight for the portal. Stark, now in space, looks upon the massive Shatari mothership as he sends the nuke towards it, blowing it up. All the Shatari on Earth fall. Stark looks on in horror before knocking out. Natasha closes the portal just as Stark falls through. Hulk catches him and the heroes meet back up. It looks like the worst has happened. <laughs> oh, he's fine. Cool. The Avengers have won the battle. Stark asks the group if they've ever tried shawarma before Thor reminds him to stay focused on the mission. They still need to take care of Loki and we get this shot. Oh my god, what a great way to end this sequence. I also want to take this moment to say that it's revealed in Captain America Civil War that 74 people died in the Battle of New York. So I'm going to count them here. Uh, it's nice to have an official number to go off of and I wanted to wait until the end of the sequence to count them up because, you know, a lot of them weren't shown on screen. The Avengers all split up, with Thor taking both Loki and the Tesseract back with him to Asgard. It seems like this is the end. Fury doesn't think it is, however. He believes everyone will show back up if another threat were to arrive. Meanwhile, Stark works on rebuilding Stark Tower. 
or should I say the Avengers Tower, as we cut to credits. But what about the post credits? The first one focuses on the other. He informs his master of Loki's failure and how powerful the heroes on Earth are. His master reveals himself as... Uh, he's just some purple guy, he's not that important. The second post credit scene, however, is arguably the most important moment in the entire MCU. This scene was actually shot after the premiere and just a few days before its wide release. This idea to have all the characters together for one last shot, sitting at a table in battle-weary New York City, eating shawarma, came about about eight weeks ago. When will they ever be together again? We looked at the schedule, we said, well, they'll be together the day after the premiere. Shawarma has since become like the Avengers iconic meal. It's sold at the Avengers campus in Disneyland, for God's sake. It's insane. And you know what? I'm glad that this movie somehow got people to try new things. How many kills did we count in the Avengers' first team up? Well, let's get to the numbers and find out. In total, we counted 166 people who died in this film, with one woman, 29 men, and 135 unknown. With a runtime of 143 minutes, this leaves us with a kill on average of every 0.86 seconds. I'll give the completed gauntlet award to Agent Coulson. I know that this might seem like a cop-out given that he has his own show, but I have yet to see evidence in the films that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is canon, so until otherwise, the award goes to him. It's a brutal death and drives the story forward in an emotional way. It was the perfect way to get the Avengers to unite. The broken Ultron bot award goes to this guy that Coulson hit with the gun. When people in this movie are blowing up and getting vaporized by space weapons, getting killed by getting whacked in the back of the head by a gun kind of makes you feel like a bit of a, uh, like a little bitch, doesn't it? So I, I, I almost feel bad for that guy. And that's it. The Avengers was a huge financial success and helped pave the way for the MCU going forward. It was a risky project that ultimately paid off for Marvel. Now everyone was eagerly awaiting the next installment in the franchise. We'll be looking at the next one, Iron Man 3, uh, in the next Kill Count, whenever that video comes out. Um, but until then, I just want to say thank you guys so much for watching. I had a lot of fun making this. I had a lot of fun revisiting this film. It still holds up really, really well. Sorry this video took a little bit to get up and to get done. It took me a while to even like get filming because of a bunch of things that were just happening in my own personal life. There was a lot of uh, big, big things happening, big things happening. Uh, but I'm glad I could film it and I'm glad I can get this video out to you guys to watch and I hope you guys enjoy it. Again, I don't want to take ownership of this idea. This video and any others that I make that are like it is inspired by the work of Dead Meat. They do uh, kill counts for horror movies and they also talk about the behind the scenes of how they were made. If you would like to go check them out, their, the link to their channel is gonna be down in the description. I forgot what the description was called. <laughs> But that's on me. I, I remembered it. I remembered it mid-sentence. I just wanted to put my own spin on it uh, for these movies that I, I really, really love. So hopefully, you know, I, I hope you guys enjoy it. And I, once again, I'm not claiming ownership of their idea. This is, yeah, the, <laughs> I, I owe all of that credit to them. So yeah, go support them if you if you are interested in this type of content. I did want to, once again, thank my sister for counting the kills. I I really appreciate it, truly. It, this video would have taken a lot longer to get done if she wasn't there helping me out, so thank you so much. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. It it really does mean the world to me that you guys, you know, watch my stuff. So, thank you. Long live cinema. Mm -hmm.